Bless up one and all, Shaman DJ Daz, one in the building, Rap Sheet Podcast, episode 15 is here. It is Thursday. Blessings to everyone who's having a wonderful day. Bless up to everyone that's going to be checking in periodically throughout time, like my lovely lady right there. Big up a Kayla J. What's up, love bug? How you doing, love? Hope everything is doing all right. And like I said, as soon as this is over, I'm coming over. So get ready to see your boyfriend because your boyfriend misses you. But right about now, we're going to just get into this podcast episode. This is um very special and near and dear to me because we're going to take the time out to chop it up with a brother who was in full control of a project that just came out a couple of days ago, honoring, in my mind, one of the greatest MCs in hip hop, um, but also one of the greatest people in hip hop, someone that just spoke their mind and, and, and spoke it very well. And my, my guest is here. I think I see him. There. We're going to bring him on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right. Man's about to come on the time. There he is. There's my what brother. Up? Of the mother. Yes, sir. Yeah, All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, Rap Sheet Podcast episode 15 is now in full effect. My guest is on this camera, on the screen. And as I was just saying, um, if you're if you're truly into honoring legacies, if you're truly into um, never forgetting the ones that are no longer here, this is the episode you definitely need to check out because the brother that you see on the camera um, had hands on was the man behind the scenes to drop an album that just came out a couple of days ago honoring the man of the hoodie that I'm wearing. I just felt like I had to put this on just to, just for this moment. Um, Five Dog was a, a very influential person to a lot of people, um, whether you were an MC, a DJ, a producer, or someone that just loved the culture. If you didn't mention this man's name, I don't know what to tell you, because this man truly blazed a trail that will never be forgotten. And my brother right here, longtime friend of Fife, got behind the boards, made calls, got appearances done, got the beats done, and dropped an album called Five Dog Forever, which came out a couple of days ago. If you did not get it, once this interview was over, go buy it, stream it. However you listen to it, listen to this album, because DJ Rothschild is here, and he's the man that for this album. We've got to – I got to give you a applause, brother. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Man. Thank you. Man. Um, so let's just get right into it because I have so many questions on how this project came to fruition. Um, so when Fife passed away, of course, it, it was a stain in everyone's life. Um, but I know somewhere that you knew you, you, well, you were hanging out with him and he did a lot of recordings, um, as if you were preparing for the inevitable. And I hate saying it that way, but let's keep it real. Like, when the inevitable was coming, he's like, all right, you know what? Let's just try to get in the studio and, and do it like we used to do it and get get this all done. But when he passed, what was going through your mind in, in, in the sense of, okay, my brother's not here in the physical, but I have this body of work in front of me. Uh, okay, this part's not done yet. This part's not done. Um, okay, I can work that part. Okay, little brother will fit in right here. Buster will fit in right here. The video for Nutshell is doing what it's doing. When did you know that you knew you had to take this project and really get this out to really honor this man's legacy? Well, well let me just backtrack track a little bit. He actually was working on his solo album. Uh, we didn't have the title Forever yet. It was another title, a couple other titles, actually. And so I, I can't say that he necessarily knew that the end was inevitable. He was just very excited about working on his solo stuff. He was recording uh, at Tip's house uh, for the Tribe album that they were doing. And in the meantime, when we weren't there, we were in the city getting our ears molded for in-ears for tour. We were uh, going to labels, letting them hear the music. We were just, you know, getting ready, having meetings with merch companies, preparing for the inevitable release of his album. I'll say that, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. he wanted to really kind of like put his album out. He was excited because he was able to like uh, record with his friends and his, his old bandmates, but also work on his solo stuff. As far as his transition, once that happened, um, it took a while, obviously, your morning and, you know, but we knew that, you know, he wanted nothing more than to get his album out. So once we kind of like settled in and kind of like formed together and kind of figured out what the plan could be, then mm -hmm. we started realizing, well, hey, there's a there's a hard drive with music. He left emails and like notepads with notes of, um, you know, liner notes and uh, producer uh, wish lists and song titles and all those things was just kind of loosely there. And at yes. the time, I don't think we realized what it was as far as like 
kind of a blueprint or a manuscript. But once we kind of like locked in and started having to really like brainstorm what this album could sound like and what assets we had, what resources we had, then we were able to kind of put them on the table. It's almost like doing a puzzle. You put all the pieces on the table and then you kind of start looking at the colors and what colors are kind of the close, what patterns are the same. You start grouping stuff. We, mm -hmm. we kind of had to do that to kind of start the process off to see, first of all, what we had, what was usable, what wasn't, and who did he want as features that we didn't know about that he might have had conversations with. So we went on his you know, Instagram and Twitter and dug through the DMs and found conversations with artists. And then we were able to start making a plan as far as like, well, this is, what, this is the direction we need to head in. Yeah, man, this is uh, amazing. We're going to get into the records and everything. I can't stop playing the album. Um, favorite yeah. track to live forever. I mean, just just to hear Pasta News and Little Brother together. That that again, <laughs> I have to do that a lot. Um, let's take it back to the beginning. How did you and Five first meet? Um, <clears throat> I mean, as far as officially, we met in 1998 in Atlanta mm -hmm. in a studio. Um, I was doing some cuts on a song he was working on with a a friend of mine, and I was brought in to do the scratches. So that's when we first met, but. I had met him, um, I had interviewed the group at my uh, alma mater, Gettysburg College, um, a year after I graduated and kind of went back to the school to interview them because they had gone to my school for a performance. And that mm -hmm. was my first time actually meeting him in person. Um, but as far as like connecting really, it happened in 98, four years later. So this was around the time when Love Movement, I think, was out. Right? It was, as far it was as after tribes. Love Movement. Okay. It was after Love Movement, they'd already broken up and he was in, living in Atlanta. Um, you know, by himself, already working on ventilation. Right. And then you just went on to, like, DJ for him whenever he did solo shows and stuff. Um, we talk about this over the phone. Um, I had told you that I had made a mixtape honoring Fife's lyrics and bars and stuff. And the intro that I used was when he went to um, Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt. Mm -hmm. How did that right. happen? For those that don't know the story, explain how he got to rock out with Scott Van Pelt and he got to perform. Explain that story for those who've never heard about it. I'm trying to remember. I feel like when we were doing the promo run for the re-release of their first album, mm -hmm. they had done something at uh, Sirius XM and they were kind of doing the whole press thing in New York. And the PR company that was hired to kind of like shuttle them around had, uh, you know, pitched the story or pitched the idea to ESPN. And uh, Scott Van Pelt's team said, sure, we definitely love to have them. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the album is making a lot of buzz and, and it's creating a lot of like waves. So let's have them on the show. And we, right. we, we drove up to Bristol, Connecticut. For, like I think it was two hours away from New York. Jerobi, him and I. And that's how that happened. Nice, man. Yeah. That was a, a great story. And that was an honorable legacy. Because Scott was, um when he said, he's like, every single time I do a mic check, I always start off by saying, microphone check, one, two, what is this? The five foot assassin with the rough neck business. And everybody around me was like, Yo, what is that? I'm like, you don't know about Fife and the Tribe Called Quest? Like, mm. right? So to hear this man give that, gem that, give that sincere storyline about who Fife was meant the world to me. And I knew he wasn't faking it because there's a lot of people who will just say stuff to make it sound good and propaganda and all that. He actually meant it. So that was that, a dope-ass story that he shared about Fife. And it was an honor. Nah, yeah. and, and also just backtracking a little bit before that, we had actually um, gone to New Orleans for the Super Bowl to perform at one of the ESPN activations at the House of Blues. And it was actually hosted by Scott Van Pelt and um, Ryan Rosillo, who's still a good friend of mine. And that's how we kind of connected with them in person. And right. I think at that point, we exchanged information with the, the head of ESPN or whatever the division that was. And then I think that's how it kind of started to get him back to make sure get him on the show. Amen and amen. If you're just now tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, we got the legendary DJ Rasta Root, executive producer, the mastermind behind Fight Dogs, latest LP, which is called Forever. If you don't have it, get it. So um, let's talk about how you got the guest appearances because the guest appearances on them is just a who's who of some mm. of the first people that are out. And um, first and foremost, I want to shout out Lyric Jones, who is a very good friend of mine. We grew up in Boston. I know her very, very well. We attended the same church together. That was way back. That's but you got Larry Jones, Buster Rhymes, Illa J, Redman, Little Brother. How did you get these guest appearances together? And how did you know which song it was going to fit on? Explain the process. I mean, a, a lot of the songs with, that have features on the album that you everybody heard, 
they were features that we kind of had done already for the album. So like okay. Busta, Redman, Dwele, um, who else? There's a couple other ones that were on the album that we actually recorded with them. You know, they were they were recorded on the song. So it wasn't like we had to add those in. Lyric Jones was added because obviously she was a good friend of Fife's and a good friend of mine. Um, who else? Maceo is Fife's brother. And yeah, they they talked talk about him being on the album. Uh, Fife had talked to Renee from Jeanne about being on the album. Um, and, and it kind of went that way. The song To Live Forever with Pass uh, and Little Brother um, that was actually gonna, supposed to be a song with Dela, Fife, and Little Brother. That was the, my, my last text to Fife about anything, and it, it went unanswered, was him me saying, hey, Fife, don't forget to reach out to Paz about the Little Brother feature. And so mm -hmm. once, once he passed away, I, I took it upon myself to make sure that that song happened because I know he wanted them on it, and they had already said yes. Yeah, because he wasn't around, I just had to kind of like re, re con configure the song and kind of like talk to them and say, "Hey, are you guys still willing to do it?" You know, even even though he's not here, and they just took the song and you know, after a little back and forth, they formulated it and it's a very, if you listen to it, it's very intricate the way the verses are broken down, eight bars here, four here, and I commend them and I'm I I you know I said I'm forever indebted to them for taking that on and taking that responsibility on to finish the song, and then they added Darian Brockington to it. Um, and then it's produced by the Rue out of uh, Houston. And so we had the beat forever, and no pun intended. And then it just ended up being a song that fit on the album. That's what's up. That's what's up. Um, the Dear Dilla record, um, when it originally came out, it was a lot different than the, than the track that's on the album. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why you, had, why you changed the beat? Did you just want to do it for creative purposes? Or was there a behind the scenes that made you come out with a different version? Well, when we first submitted songs to the publishing company that was going to be clearing the samples mm -hmm. all the uh you know, have to write out each sample that's used or they can identify with it, whatever software and you have to put in the timestamps of when it's used for how long and then when we got the quote back for that song because i sampled a ton of stuff in that song i sampled common tribe i mean just name it uh, slum village you know everybody the, the quote came back i think it was 27 or thirty-seven thousand for the song and so I kind of just said, just made the decision. I said to the estate, and I said, you know what? Let's just do a different version of it. Let's take out all the samples. I'll, I'll strip it down to nothing, just the acapella, and build a, build a song around it. And then I, I built a sample-free song um, using Serato Studio and actually used one of the packs in Serato Studio. And it's weird, a couple of days ago, the producer who made the loop, you know, the, the copyright-free loop, heard mm -hmm. the song and he posted about it. So we're, we're connected now, which is kind of cool. And... That's how it came about, and we, you know, we had the song. Um, I wasn't gonna put scratches in it, but you know, I, I always feel like every hip hop song needs to have scratches. And um, Fife mentioned, you know, scratches cuts by DJ Ross the Root, so I felt the need to put them in there. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last piece was the hook, and uh, I, you know, and I, you know, worked on it for two years to get Q Tip to be on the album in some way, and that's kind of the song he narrowed it down that he wanted to be a part of, and it, it kind of makes sense, you know. Yeah, it definitely does, man. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, for everyone that just tuned in, like I said, you got the legendary DJ Roster Root here, the mastermind, the executive producer behind Five Dog Forever. And, and it pains me to say Fife's last album. I, I just I, <laughs> I, I just can't get that out of, of my head. So, of course, I'm going to ask, are there any records that didn't make this that might come out in the future? Do you have stuff behind the scenes that he did? Or will this really be the last time we hear Fife in album form? Um, we have a couple alternate versions of songs. We have a couple unused verses from mm -hmm. the, song, the songs that are on the album. So we can kind of shift stuff around. But my, my gut says probably not only because I feel like the story's been told. You know what I mean? Right. These 13 songs or 12 actual rapping songs on the album is part of the legacy. And part of the reason for naming the album forever is because I feel like it's an album you can, you can kind of pop in in 20 years, 15 years, whatever, and you can see yeah. it's still relevant. And so I think like it's a nice punctuation on his career and his life. And I'd like to see it, you know, kind of left that way. Absolutely. Um, someone in the in the in the in the comments asked, why wasn't there any Q tip produ production on this album? I mean, we could ask that question, you know, all day long as far as like the members of Tribe not being on it or are they on it? You know, and that's that's a conversation that's happened a lot over the years. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a Fife album, and I extended 
you know, the invitation to the band members to be on the album. And mm -hmm. I strongly believe that they, they committed and they um, added on what they felt was comfortable for them. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, a, it's a morning process and people aren't all the same as far as creatively, you yeah. know, so, you know, Ali mixed a couple songs. Um, he's actually says something in one of the songs, come on, Fife, or come on, son, he says, and then, yes. you know, Q-Tip did the hook. And, and if that's where they feel their involvement is on the album, I'm more than happy to accept that. And I think it's, it's totally cool. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I, I wonder, but I'm like, you know what? The, the, the negative stuff that they did go through. I mean, for those of us, whoever saw the bio, the, the, the biopic knows what, and we don't need to rehash all that because they definitely have come together and has squashed everything. So I, I really like how it was presented. Again, I think you did a really, really great job with what you had to work with because um, when this album came out, it made me think of the one of the best yet album that Gangstar dropped because Primo was in the same sense as you. He's like, all right, all these guru verses laying around. Let me see if I can put something together and came out to be another fabulous project as yours. So Yeah, I think for this, I mean, I, I don't want people to feel like the album came out and it was our interpretation of what we felt a five album needed to be. It's mm -hmm. actually very close to the direction we were heading anyway. You know, besides obviously the song with his mom and Angela Wimbush, that would probably wouldn't have happened, but the song is a, the, the album is a fight album. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I don't think it's a stretch. It's us really just, kind of calculating what he wanted and kind of doing it to the best of our, of our mm -hmm. ability. You know, it's not, I don't think it's my album re honoring Fife, even though it might be indirectly, it's a Fife album. You know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of where I want to go with this because like I'm getting emotional just thinking about some of the stuff he said on certain records. Um, so uh, which one was it? Uh, the record. I'm assuming that one of the records, uh, I got to go back. So I think it was Residual. Um, Curiosities? That's the one. Now, was he, yeah, that record. Was he that's speaking? That's the one with Lyric Jones. Yeah, that's the one with Lyric Jones. Was he, was that a song about his wife? Because I think, I think that was the end of the, at the end of that, I think there was an interlude where there was a bunch of messages afterward and his wife left the message saying, come back home. I'm, I'm just re-getting, because she no, gave no, so yeah, yeah, so residual actually is not about his his wife per se. Okay. It's okay. just that. It's residual curiosity. So the what if of you met somebody in your life at any point in your life and what if they were still here? What could have happened? You know, it's a very honest like depiction of like mm -hmm. the human psyche, you know, like you always think back, what if this relationship worked out? What if this person was still in my life? What would it be like? So that song is actually kind of like reminiscing on the what if of thing, but not so much wanting to live in the past. It's mm -hmm. just Fife was a storyteller. Slick Rick was his favorite MC. So the storytelling part of it is very intricate in that song. So you're hearing what Tribe was going through when they were touring. He's he's painting the picture. Um they're they're on the bill with Daylight and Red Man and it's literally just him storytelling. And part of that is meeting a young female who has a, I think it's a twin sister and mm -hmm. just maybe having a crush on her. You know what I mean? And finding out she passes away. And that's that's where the residual curiosity is. Because he's, years later, he's thinking about that friendship. You know what I mean? That's deep, man. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Because I was listening to it, I'm like, wait, is it, is this, it sounded like, it sounded like a love story. And then it just went into reminiscing on certain things. I'm like, okay, is he talking about his wife? Is he talking about something else? Did he mess with it? So I was just trying to figure out where, where that was. So thank you for breaking that. And, and it's funny, it's funny you say that because if you think about it, you know, like, as an artist, at the end of the day, for example, with Fife, when he said something, something is longer than a DC-20 aircraft, that doesn't exist. That aircraft doesn't exist. It's a DC-20, right. right? When he talked about Garvey High School, that school doesn't exist. So it's almost like poetic liberty. It's his creative liberty to kind of generate whatever story. So who knows if, if that twin even existed? It, it could literally just be rap. You know what I mean? Right. That's the great thing about rap records. You can just pen something and vision it or an interpretation of something. And no one was greater than that than right. Fife Dog. So let's start to run through some of the records um, real fast. I'm going to keep you on for like another 20 minutes or some of them. I'm going to let you because I know you probably got a lot of things to do. So Only a coward. <laughs> Woo! Lord, 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 Lord. I wish I had time to dissect the lyrics and actually write them down, but only a coward, man, hit me in the head right off rip. Like, when I go back to some of the Tribe records, 
the verse from We Can Get Down and everything like when when Tri when Q Two Kip went, it's like that dog, it's like it's like that dog, it's like that. Yes. Mm. I got that vibe right in my head. It's only when only a coward started to play. I'm like, do a chorus like that. Do do some introduction stuff like that and then go into the bars. Mm -hmm. uh, when you listen to Only a Coward. Um, knowing how great of a storyteller he was and how he liked to basically show his um, battle bravado in a sense. What was going through your mind when you played back Only a Coward as it when it was finally mixed and mastered? What was you thinking? I mean, I just love, well, first of all, I love how, well, let me just backtrack a little bit on that song. That's, mm -hmm. act, that's actually not the original beat that I recorded on. It was a Ninth Wonder beat. There's another version of it. Um, mm -hmm. But once we had the song done and we were kind of in album mode, Ninth was like, he emailed me or us and he said, hey, send me the files so I can produce the record. And in my head, I'm thinking that's more like rearranging a little bit, um, some dropouts here and there, maybe changing on some instruments, but he sent back a whole nother beat, you know what I mean? And maybe mm -hmm. because we, we recorded that in North Carolina so many years ago, he probably felt like also it wasn't a representation of his, maybe his current production. So maybe he right. wanted to update it, you know what I mean? As far as listening to the lyrics of the song, when I listen to it, I understand it to be um, we all have friendships and we all have people that we love dearly that are in situations that may be toxic, that are in relationships that probably aren't the best for them. And they're, they stay in it, you know, but as their friends, you tell them you can do better or look, look at all these things this person is doing that, you know, is not really honoring you. Um, but at the end of the day, you love your friend. He says, that you know, as my BFF, I love you to death. So he's almost being you know, very protective of his friendships and people he loved. And Fife was very much like that. So it completely makes sense that he would do a song letting people know that the people close to him that he loved, he's willing to do anything to protect him. You know, in the original song, there were some gunshots in there. You know, we had to take it out. You know, it just was a little crazy, you know. But he, he you know, he was kind of making a statement as far as if he loves you and he, he cares about you, he'll do anything to protect you. And that's kind of more what I feel the song's about, you know, than anything. Right. If you're just now tuned in, ladies and gentlemen, we got DJ Rosteru and Racing, where we're just dissecting the Five Dog album forever, which is in stores now on street. Well, in store. I'm speaking old school like it's in store. Excuse me. I mean, it's Digitally everywhere. Make sure you get that. Um, fall back. Um, I, in, in my mind, I listened to that, and I'm like, okay, he must be uh, imagining life you know, people who don't have to go through dialysis and, and things of that nature. That's what I got from the record. I'm assuming that's what it was about. For those that don't know, he was on dialysis all the time due to his, um, you know, his health and the things that he was going through way back when. Um, so is that an accurate assumption? That's what Fallback was about? Um, kind of, sort of, not really, but maybe a little bit. What it was, okay. was remember, he got his, his kidney transplanted in 2008. And, and these, these bars he wrote and these verses he wrote can come back from that time. You know what I mean? It could have been from then. My thought is, you know, being restricted to going to the clinic three times a week to do dialysis, sometimes four, probably mm -hmm. took a strain on his relationship too because you can't move the way you want to move. You're at a clinic for four hours a day. And yeah. I think what he was saying is once he got the kidney and he was up and running, was, be, it was able to be mobile, he could do the things he wanted to do with his wife and his kids and his his nieces and nephews and just be able to move them around. You want to go here? Let's go here. You want to buy this? Let's buy this. And I think it was more so like the reality of what he was going through at the time as far as the freedom. Mm -hmm. And I remember he called me when the, the kidney first started working. He just, you could tell he just felt so free because he wasn't bound to like going to a hospital all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the clinic. So he was able to move around. And if he wanted to go take a trip for 10 days, he could do that without having to worry about dialysis scheduling and things like that. And that's what the song is more about. It's like, the good things of family life, the, the good things mm -hmm. about being with someone you love and taking them places and, and treating them and just, you know, showering them with love. Let, let's take it, um, let, let's go back a little bit. So after, you know, the surgery was a success and he was able to to um, still move around and, and resume touring with Tribe back at that time, obviously I bet you were with him and you you saw you was making sure he was okay in the, in the midst of all that. Was touring life hard for him back then? Was it easy? Like, explain what it was like at that time when he had just got out the, you know, the hospital, got the surgery, got the surgery done, and he was able to move. Um, was it an easy process him getting back into it, or was it still difficult? No, once, once, once he was, uh, you know, off dialysis because of the kidney transplant, he was able to mm -hmm. move just like you and I could move. So it okay. made things a lot easier because 
it was one less thing to try and plan out as far as the clinic visits and, and, you know, him exerting himself on stage and then being tired and all those things we had to watch for years, it took that off our plate. So he was able to really just go and really have fun. Right, right, right. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. All right. So that leads into God said, perfect, perfect segue. Um, that record is basically talking about how his prayer got answered and he was able to get a kidney thanks to his beautiful wife. Um, and she was yep. still able to live. Huh? No, you're right. I'm, I'm oh, okay. You. And so just, just listening to that, man, and, and I could, I could tell it was heartfelt because like with anybody going through something for your wife to be a match and is willing to do that mm -hmm. just so you could live because she knows how special of a man he is to millions and millions of MCs and DJs and this and that. Right. For her to do that, kudos to her. Um, so for him to write about it, I think that's like the ultimate love letter record. And I think that record will stand the test of time um, for his wife's legacy, who is still amongst us and still carrying on the tradition of what Malik started and ultimately will finish. So big, yeah. uh, big ups to Godsend. Um, that was a crisis track, was that not? Did That was a no, crisis No, Godsend was Bobby Ozuna and G. Coop. Okay. Um, and they're, they're, I don't want to say claim to fame, but they work with Rafael Sadiq a lot. Um, they're from the West Coast, so Fife, obviously, having lived in the Bay, he connected with them, and I believe the original track, if I'm not mistaken, had Raphael Sadiq on it, on the hook, but when we brought Dwelly in to do the hook, it fit in more with what was, Fife was saying on the track, more than what Sadiq was saying on his hook, so, you know, we go back with Dwelly back to, like, 2000, 2001, yeah. so that's fam, so it was only right that we had him on the song with Fife, and that's actually a song that we sent uh, Dwelly the, the the session and he added so Fife actually heard that song um, the verses were a little longer and what I had to do is actually funny enough had to, had to cut the verses they were longer verses but the wow. way we were able to cut it luckily the way he structured the song it, was, it wasn't that hard we found places where we could truncate some of what he was saying and it still reached its point so when mm -hmm. he says uh, about his wife being the donor of the kidney that was cut we cut out a lot of deep a little detail to make it a little more concise so we wouldn't lose the listener. Awesome sauce, man. Oh, man. If you're just now tuned in, we got Rasta Rude right here. Basically dissecting the entire Fife album, how it was made, how it was constructed. Um, wow factor. Mm. Um, it's one thing for... We, we, we hear a lot of MCs and, and people over the years reference Fife lyrics and, 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 and big up Fife, but for Fife to do a record where he is... Shouting out the pioneers, the legends like Rock Kim and, and, and Kane and, and BDP and representing the 70s. And, and what a record that was to actually hear his perspective and just be clever with the wordplay and, and do all that. And I like that record right there, I think is a great record for DJs to play. I think everyone should be playing that record on radio if it yeah. hasn't been on radio. I think that was a great standout for me. Um, how important. Is it as as a longtime friend and mentor to Fife and tour buddy and all that? How is it important for you to make sure that this song was heard to know that Fife shows love to the people that even came before him or the people that even came after him? He's like, let me still show those people love because they're a continuation of what I started. How was that? Why was that important to you on this particular record? <laughs> I mean, well, that, again, that that was a song, another song that was recorded as is, except adding Maceo. We added him. Um, I, I, I started thinking about like what songs would sound good on and because Maceo has that kind of wild kind of like rah-rah kind of like ad-lib kind of voice I felt it was perfect for the song um, Fife always does I'm um, sorry did pay homage to a lot of you know the people that he came up under people he admired and he had no he had no qualms about giving credit where credit was due and this song pretty much just gives credit to all the things that he thought made him say, wow, like, wow, Michael Jackson, wow, whoever, whatever. Yeah. It was funny, it was light, it was aggressive as far as the production, but it was also like a, a very much a Fife record as far as like just being very vocal about the things he loved. Word up, word up. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Ross Teru right here holding it down. It's basically honoring the legacy of Fife Diggy. Let's just get personal a little bit. What is a favorite memory you will have of Fife Dog? Like a tour moment, a moment where y'all were hanging out at your house, just doing something. What is a memory about Fife that many people probably don't know about? I mean, one of my favorite memories of Fife were 
um, where I felt like he was like, happiest was um, when we were recording the Tribe album uh, at the end of one of the sessions, um, the, a couple of the managers were in like the lob, kind of lobby, but the foyer area of, of Tibbs' house. And we were discussing, whatever we were discussing, I don't remember what it was. And then we just heard like these like sneaker sounds behind us, like chirping on the ground. Mm -hmm. And we all, we all look back and we see Tip and Fife doing old school dances together and like just playing around like old buddies. And, you know, I just wish like the fans could be a fly on the wall to see that because beyond what he said in Forever, the mm -hmm. song, um, seeing them together in the studio and hearing their, them go back and forth with verses and it was magic, man. And it wasn't magic because I was like, ooh, a new Tribe album. To me, it was magic because it showed that anybody could heal from anything. You know, anybody could actually make amends with someone they might have hated at one point um, mm -hmm. and move on with your life. And I think that's the greatest lesson in this for me is that Fife left that impact on the world that no matter what you go through with your health, with loved ones and, you know, old friends or whatever, you can always change it. You're not bound by time. You're not bound by whatever the conviction was before for the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah, I, I totally uh, agree with that. It's just to, to not not to stray away, but to see the crap that Slaughterhouse is going through right now, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just heartfelt. It's just like, come on, y'all are like a family. And whatever reason, the family is like split apart. Two are going this way, two are going that way. And it makes right. the dynamic of one of the greatest groups that will never be because of petty, petty ish. So I'm glad you mentioned that because it, it broke my heart to see Tip and Fife just do, going through the, the dumbness that mm -hmm. it was. Well, well, here's the thing though like, I've, I've gone through like issues with really close friends and have stopped talking to friends the exact same way. The only mm -hmm. difference is, is that my life isn't on public display. You know what I mean? My right. life isn't bound to like a, an article in a, in a magazine or an interview on TV. So they can't even beef amongst themselves and have a little squabble because it's going to be magnified to something great. And yeah. if you're not equipped for that type of life, it can really make you crumble more than the actual fight itself. It's the pressure mm -hmm. from the outside sources. Right. Making assumptions right. about things and writing about it when it may really not be what it is. It just might be just a little beef between you and your boy. I fight with my friends all the time, but at the end of the day, it's because we love each other. You know what I mean? Right, right on. Right on. I hear exactly what you're saying, man. It's just, if you got beef with someone, basically go to that person. Pretty much, man. Like, and squash Don't, don't subtweet him. Don't, like, post little subliminals. Yeah. Don't talk to them. Like, listen to what Feisty said. If I could do it over again, I'd sit down with my friend. With yeah. your reason why this shit had to end. Like, that's the craziest line in life. Like, who do you know? Yeah. Who do you, I know we're forwarding a little bit to that song, but who do you know in the middle of a, a hip hop song says, just says, stop the music, stop the music, and just wants you to hear their voice uninterrupted by music and distraction. So you can really hear and you can really drive the point home. That's what Forever the Song is. Yeah. Um... I heard that that in that verse. I'm glad that line. I'm glad you just said it because I was about to repeat it myself. Um, when I heard that, I'm like, okay, that right there. And I know Tip was listening when he said that, and I'm sure Tip probably shed a tear at that moment and was like, man, this this. It, it, at that moment, it dawned on me that Fife isn't really not here. But to leave that testament right there for anyone to hear at any given time really puts a whole synopsis on just how important Tip was to fight. And fight was to Tip because they needed each other. They were the yin to the yang and it worked. Yeah, the dynamic like, like, worked like, so like perfectly. Fife always say, Fife always said, you can't have the nasally without the raspy. It's one It's one in both. It's not one or the other. And that's kind of how he looked at it. Like, But he also understood like, just because I'm fighting or disagree with you doesn't mean I hate you. Doesn't mean that yes. this is forever as far as us not liking each other. Just for now, we just disagree. And I think as adults, that's okay, you know? It really is. It really is okay. Um, we got Rasta Root here. We're about to truly wrap this up. I, I want to thank him for doing this during a, such a busy time right now, a busy schedule. So what's next? Um, I know you're in Chicago right now. Um, are you going to do another streaming event like the one that just happened? Like what, what's, the next, what's the next step for you in this process? I mean, it's, the, it's, it's a great question. I think I would like to do another streaming event at some point. I don't know where, maybe L.A. or something. Um, just because I'm trying to, like, be mindful and considerate of where he had a lot of fans, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they could enjoy the moments we had yesterday in New York or Atlanta on Monday. Um, but for me right now, getting back, 
I'm on the road with Dwelly now, but once I get back home next week, it's definitely some rest. You know, I think it's important to like yeah. have, have been going so hard for so long. You got to rest and take care of yourself. So I'm very cognizant of that. And I'm going to definitely take a break, first of all. But in the meantime, uh, just keep planning the rollout. Keep playing out the rollout. What are the next merch drops? What can we do to keep the album in people's ears? What can we do to get more interviews? And of course, the press has been incredible. Like, it's been amazing. But I don't think the work's done yet. You know what I mean? I think I didn't think about after the drop of the album. I had no expectation, but I knew we had to keep working the record. So I'm just going to keep working the record and making sure that we keep it in people's ears in front of their faces so that he gets like, not only like the like his flowers, but also the more people that hear it, the more people it's going to touch. And I think this album has touched a lot of people in a lot of ways, more than I thought it would, honestly. I thought it would more touch those who knew him really well, like his family. But I, I'm getting, you know, DMs and messages and calls and texts from people are saying, like, I had unresolved issues with grieving for somebody who passed away. And th this particular song made me realize that I hadn't really dealt with things. You know what I mean? So um, I think I think music is, is here to heal people. And I think this album is going to heal a lot of people. And I think that is a very valiant and like brave thing Fife did to make himself vulnerable to open up to people for them to then open up to other people. So absolutely. Yeah. He, he sure did. Um, I got a question for you in the box. Someone wants to know, will there be vinyls or actual physical, physical copies of the CD available for purchase? Yeah. There, I don't know about CDs per se. I know we're definitely doing vinyl. It's just, as most people know that collect vinyl, there's a huge like backlog of orders. So you can't just like, put an album out and put the vinyl out, you know, three days later, unless you got the album done a year mm -hmm. ago, just honestly, right. 10 months ago, you know, we, we dealt with a couple like stumbling blocks getting the album done. So when we got the deadline to turn it in February 23rd, it was down to the wire as far as features and mixing and mastering and all, you know, Bob Power working six songs at the same time. So we're just lucky we got it to the finish line and we'll think about those other things after. Um, obviously, as a DJ, I want vinyl too. So, for sure, yes, it's just, it just won't happen immediately. Um, I will say, if you want to come to Kansas City, we can set something up. I think we we could do a networking event here and have the album streamed here because there's a lot of Five Dog fans here in Kansas City, a lot That's of cool. DJs too that would want to be in that atmosphere and and just share the moment. Um, yeah, I that, will ask if you do to do the huh? That, that'd be great because one of our one of Five's good friends. And now my good friend is um, Eric Bienemy that coaches for you all. So okay. I, I would love I would, I'd love an excuse to hang out with him. You know what I mean? Hey, let, let's, um, you know, when, when you get back from doing what you're doing now and you get some time to rest, sure. um, let's change the numbers and try to really get that done. I would love to be a part of that. Anything I can do to keep the legacy going, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. For sure. One thing, though, when you do come, bring little brother with you. For those that saw the streaming event, after the To Live Forever song was done, this guy pulls a rabbit out of his hat and gets Scudder and, and Big Pooh to do Loving It. And well, I, let, I, let, I, let, I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> but let me explain that to you. So, you know, I've known Pooh and them for years, Scudder, like for years. But, you know, it's just a mutual respect for each other. But when when rapper uh, Big Pooh said he was coming to the event, a few days after that, I was like, I got you on the list, fine. He said, I'm bringing Scudder. My answer to him was, I have two mics. I just said, I said, I got two mics. He thought I was joking, yeah. maybe. And as soon as he told me that, I text my friend, uh, DJ Fudge, who's, who DJ the event. I said, do you have the Love It instrumental? I said, if you don't get it, because we might need it for the event. So once they finished introducing um, To Live Forever and we played it and they came up and talked, yeah, we had two mics. Like I said, I had two mics. I usually keep my word. And I told him, I was like, you're all going to hate me, but... I think y'all should perform Love In front of everyone, they're not going to say no in front of 200 people. You know what I mean? I knew no. that. And so he dropped the record. And they I don't know when's the last time they performed that together. But I think they were happy. And they were like, damn, he put us on the spot. But that's family. So I'll, I'll yeah. deal with that, the repercussions of that later, I feel. Like, you know what? That's manageable. You know what I mean? For me. And you know, it, it, it's funny how you said that and got that done. Because I go back to a little brother documentary as, as, as when they were coming back out. And Pooh said the same thing. He was like, look. I haven't spoken with Tay in, in, in so long, but we just lost five. 
-hmm. Let me go reach out to Tay and just see how he's doing. We don't have to talk about business or music. Let me just let me just see how he's doing because life is not promised. I could die tomorrow, and if I don't talk to Tay and at least just say how he's doing or whatever the conversation may be, that's just like a question mark, and we don't know where it's going to go. And I'm glad that happened because they got to come back out, and that album was brilliant. But it's just all about relationships, man. You you built a relationship with that guy for so long, even with Knife Wonder. And what y'all created was like a, a testament to, to just real hip-hop everywhere. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I feel like also indirectly, like, you know, we couldn't have got, we didn't get Fonte and Pooh on a Ninth Wonder beat, right? But we yeah. got Fonte and Pooh on Fife's album, and we have Ninth Wonder on the album, too, for the Fife, uh, a beat for Fife. So yeah. we have Little Brother on the album. So there is a, there's a, there's a reunion of sorts, and... They're going right. to, you know, this conversation, and I'm sure it'll make them think like this. I might make them think, you know what? Why are we beefing about this stuff? You never know. You know what I mean? And, and even to add to that, Crisis uh, did some records, and Crisis is like LB fam as well. So it kind of, it, it's just cool to see North Carolina get their representation on this. Mm -hmm. um, as we close out um, this ep this episode, again, I want to thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to do this with me. Mm -hmm. In your words and in your mind, how will Fife be remembered? I mean, beyond the album and beyond all those things, the people that met him and knew him, I feel like I look at him as like an angel on earth, like the most honest, the most raw, the most authentic, the most passionate, the most loving person that I've ever met in the package of someone who's 5253, five, a giant. You know what I'm saying? Like for him to move the needle or the paradigm shift that I think this album's causing, that says a lot. That says to me that like love wins and that, that like we can be peaceful and loving and it doesn't have to be all about fighting all the time. You can just make good music and bring people together every once in a while to listen to music and your job's done. And so yeah. in that sense, um, seeing how we close the album out and seeing that Forever the Song was the last song he recorded, like his, his work here was done. And you know, as much as I missed him, I know that this was part of God's like intention and I yeah. don't ever question that. And it's just what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I again want to say thank you for um, putting this all together, even when probably times got rough and you probably wanted to give up and just say, nah, I can't do this. This is mentally draining. The motivation is this, but you, you knew the reason why it had to happen. So I personally want to say thank you for dropping such a, a great, fabulous album, but also letting his story be told because in the past, people who passed away come out with albums that they would know they would not make. Nah, um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've said this several times, but part of the reason why, well, two things. Let me start with this. First thing, even though I, I stitched the album together, it did take, for sure, his mom, his father, the yes. estate, of course, his wife, the attorney, the paralegal, the graphic designer, Everybody who contributed to this album, producers, artists, they all had, down to my niece who transcribed the lyrics for the DSPs and stuff. She, wow. Fife, Fife knew her when she was two years old. He met her. So she has a history with him, too. She's probably heard the album because of transcribing it more than anybody over and over and over. And so she has, she was able to have closure uh, with him via that. But also, mm -hmm. more importantly, everybody down from Bob Power down to my niece knew Fife or had a story with Fife. And I think that's what makes it so authentic because people who knew him knew his intention. And I think we were guided by that more than yeah. anything. So nothing yeah. on this album is like, why did they put him on there? Why is that happening? Why, why does this beat sound like that? Because we know we know what beats Fife like. We knew who, what producers yeah. he liked and we knew what artists he liked. So all we have to do is really just stitch it together. So, um, of course, we, and this will be the last thing I said. I should have said this earlier in the interview, but I just totally slipped my head. Nutshell, um, shout out to Reg, Reggie Noble, Redman, and Busta. Uh, incredible record. And I was paying attention to the patterns that the MCs were using, and it took me back to Redman uh, when he did the verse for Hardcore, how he literally took letters and then put words that each of those letters represented. And then I see Fife doing it, and then Busta doing it. I was like, this... Are you, are you talking about the red man, the red man line, uh, a monster murder motherfucks like Manson with the M's? 
Yes. I, I, I didn't notice that, but that's dope. I, and I love that record. That's one of my favorite records. Yeah. Made me think of that right away. So the seed. Um, so my question is, um, are there going to be any other videos soon coming from the album? Will we see any more visuals? Yeah, I actually, um, I worked with Tony Reams, who's one of our, like, dear friends and also directed Nutshell 1, 2, and French Kiss, along with Coney Rock. Um, we actually, last night at SOB's, as a surprise to his mother and sort of surprise to his wife, there's going to be a visual for forever that's complete. Um, and if you haven't cried yet, you're probably going to cry watching the video. Um, I can barely get through it, honestly. But um, I think that song deserved a visual. And so we worked tirelessly, you know, 27 hours out of a 24-hour day working on it to get it right because it, it, it deserves it. And I think to have a visual representation of that song is even better because it really drives the point home about family and history and yeah. look how we came up and where we came from and look where we got to. Why are we letting this end right now? And that's, you'll see that it's going to probably drop this week. I just don't know what day. Okay. Well, I look forward uh, to seeing that. I look forward to seeing whatever it is you do for this record. And um, I guess that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's how, we're gonna, that's how we're going to end this. Thank you to DJ Roster Root, ladies and gentlemen. Please follow him on social media. Follow him, DJ Roster Root, here on IG because you might want to stay tuned for what's about to happen. I'm, this is just the beginning with this. And um, salute to, to support this man, period. Right now he's on the road with Dwelle, one of the greatest R&B artists in the world. And I'm not just saying that because he's here. He actually is. <laughs> just doing great things. The work don't stop. And um, I applaud you for, for really, really doing this and honoring his legacy in the way that it needed to be honored. Um, if he were here right now, I'm sure that he would be looking at you and be like, job well done. Job well done. So I, I appreciate you saying that means a lot to me. I think like, like I don't know. That's my that's my best friend. So I feel like whether he's here or not, I'm gonna do right by my best friend. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and that's all I know how to do was take care of what we kind of try to build together. And if I didn't wasn't here to finish, I know he would have finished it anyway. So it's only right that I do the same thing. And that's kind of what was the driving force and the energy I went with in completing the album is because I knew he would have done it himself or we were on our way to doing it so why not just finish it absolutely absolutely well ladies and gentlemen this is DJ Roster Root my name is DJ Dazwan I appreciate this brother taking the time out of his busy schedule to, to vibe with us and everybody who got to check it out get Fife Dog forever buy three copies and just give it to two of your friends or whatever because we gotta honor this brother the right sure. way okay Everybody up on Linden know he got the job done. Um, Rastaru, thank you so much. Um, let's exchange info when you get a chance. We can build on Kansas City and get it done. I'll start to reach out to people now and see if we can come up with a good format to make it happen. Sure. And um, my brother, thank you. Thank so you. And thank much. you for a great interview. Thank you for allowing me to come on your platform. And, and, and thank you for asking great questions. And thank you for the people in the, uh, I guess, audience that asked those questions. I hope I was thorough in my answers. And you know, if I haven't answered your question, just inbox me and I will gladly answer any questions. All right, y'all. That just, just about does it for the Rap Sheet Podcast, episode 15, DJ Roster Root, DJ Daz One. Go get the album, listen to it. Salute Rhapsody, Lyric Jones, Buster, Illa J, Red Man, Little Brother, Pasta News, um, DJ Maceo. Am I forgetting anybody else that's on I mean, the album? You rattle it off better than I could. You keep going, whatever. <laughs> and DJ Roster Root as well is also on the album, sprinkling it in. Um, here and there. Um, aside from the fight project, uh, let's just talk about you for a minute. Do you have anything up and coming that we need to know about? Um, I'm not. I mean, this is going to be the my life for the next you know few months. So okay. nothing really right now. I I hate to take something on now and not finish what I've already done. So I, I'll maybe come back on the show in a few months and maybe we can discuss new things. But for now, it's pretty much all about the fight album forever. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Happy birthday, Maceo. Is Maceo's birthday today? It's oh, shoot. Maceo's birthday, yeah. It oh, is. shoot. Well, salute DJ Maceo, a.k.a. Plug 3, a.k.a. Baby Huey, uh, De La Soul Massive Forever and Ever. Um, actually, one last question. I forgot. See, this is how I I'm do. I'm going to start charging um, you. Yeah, go ahead. Charge it to my head. I'll cash app you. I got dough. Um, true, I, I know it's that True Goy uh, wasn't 
on the album. I know he was having health issues at the time. I think he's gotten a lot better. Was that the reason why he wasn't on the album, or was there another reason? No, I think um, when, if I recall, when Fife talked to Poss and Little Brother about being on the song, it mm-hmm. wasn't so much to get the whole all the groups together because then imagine you have to be Little Brother, All of Tribe, and Dela. It's the representation of the groups. So I don't, I don't think he was ever a consideration. It'd be dope to have him on there, but it was never talked about. Um, yeah. We originally wanted Fonte to just do a singing hook, and Fonte wow. texted me and said, "Yo, you're not gonna have me on no song with <laughs> you know my favorite rappers and not do a verse. I need six minutes, right. or whatever." And so. <laughs> What am I going to say to that? So that's how that happened. And, and, and if, you to, if you listen to the singing, actually, it's Darian and Fonte singing. On yes. The yeah. Okay. yeah. You can Definitely hear deep rock at the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thanks again, my brother. I, I will let you go. I'll send you $20 for the question. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Drop me your cash app. I it's definitely will do that. It's all good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, sir. So DJ Rossaru, ladies and gentlemen, producer extraordinaire. He's the reason why Fight Forever is what it is today. So please, whatever your streaming platform is, go listen to the album, share it with your friends, and let's keep the memory of Fight Dog alive because it needs to be kept alive forever and a day, all day and day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Salute to you. Take it easy, man. And we will definitely chop it up and talk about that stuff in the future. For sure. Appreciate you. All right. Yep. All right, my brother. Peace and love. God bless. Yep. Dun, dun, dun.